I'm going to introduce Dr. Ryan Quinn, who's our academic director at the Project on Positive Leadership. My seat if you want. But before I do that, I would really like for you to just take a look at the postcard on your table. Um, we have um, a link to nominate people who are out in the world demonstrating positive leadership or acts of positive leadership. Not necessarily that they're a positive leader, but they're actually demonstrating acts of positive leadership. So please scan that QR code if you witness somebody demonstrating positive leadership. We would love for you to nominate them and we will honor them hopefully at the end of the year, academic year with an award. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everybody paid attention to that. Okay, so Dr. Ryan Quinn, he's our academic director, as I said, of the Project on Positive Leadership. I'm gonna try to remember all, he has, <laughs> he told me not to do this. He has many roles at the University of Louisville, including faculty. He is the Dean of Innovation and Strategy at the College of Business. He is the Chair of the Management and Entrepreneurship Department. Not and, the academic director of the Project of Positive Leadership. So that's four, four hats that he wears. He is going to talk to you today about patience and how to lead yourself with patience and your team. So let's welcome Ryan Quinn. Thank you. All right, before we dive in, I actually want to ask one follow-up question on Patty's presentation. The last question that she asked was, how would you use this yourself? And I would like to ask a slightly different question. How would you use this with or get your people to use Patty's tool? So what do you use to help use this tool to help other people become better leaders in terms of making decisions and being decisive? How might you use this? Yeah. Ask these kinds of questions in meetings. Okay. So actually you could just throw out the questions as you use them. Good. Experience. What do you mean by that? Um, personal experience on how it worked and give an example of what you utilize to put in ah, action. Ah, so like sharing stories. Absolutely. Okay, good, nice. Propose it as the structure of a meeting, like let's try this thing out. I like it. I think that's where you were headed towards yeah. the end there, right? Yeah, I like it. Good. Suhas? I, I would say it's not for me. Say that again? You're not doing this for me. Do it for yourself. All right, so I like that because you're talking about you're the motivation for why you should use this tool. All right, one of the reasons that the Project of Positive Leadership, why we create these instructional tools, is so that it doesn't stay with us. Like you get a training program and, you know, good, you've got it, but now it's done. By putting these onto paper and creating tools out of them, it's so that they can go out into the world and live on their own and, and you can continue to use them. And so I'd like you to think about that both with um, Patty's tool that she just introduced to you and also with the tool that I'm about to introduce to you is how can you make this live beyond just using it yourself, but actually in your organizations, in your lives, wherever else there needs to be positive leadership. So I'm going to jump in here, and I'm actually going to skip to my, oh, there we go, to my second slide first. I want to talk a little bit about how we define positive leadership at the Project on Positive Leadership. And in saying this, I want to make it clear, we are not saying this is the one and only correct definition of leadership or positive leadership. There's lots of definitions, different ones are useful for different things, and that's fine. The reason why our mission at the Project on Positive Leadership is to increase positive leadership in the world is, uh, I think, going to become clear as we talk about why we're using this, and then it'll also frame what I'm about to share with you. So, you'll notice here on this diagram, the dotted line surrounds what we're referring to as leadership. And you'll notice that leadership is a relational phenomenon. If nobody follows, you haven't led, right? And that's part of what, so I am, if I want to lead, I'm dependent on you to actually lead, to be a leader, to do those things. And that's something we often forget when we talk about this. So even when I take the first step as a leader and I exhibit excellence in some kind of virtue, that's awesome. We'd like to see more of that in the world, period. Uh, people exhibiting more excellence of various virtues, and I'll talk more about virtues in just a second. But at the Project on Positive Leadership, we're hoping for even more than that. We're hoping for people to not only exhibit excellent, excellence, but to do it in a way that inspires others to follow. And that's uh, a big deal for us in how we do this. Now, when we say excellence, what we mean is excellence that deviates from norms or conventions. 
So it could be that most people around here taking one virtue, let's say honesty, most people are honest most of the time. And that's great. But we're looking for exceptional honesty. Somebody who's willing to say, hey, listen, I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm telling you because I care about you, and boom, here's the honest answer. And most people around here don't do that, right? But when somebody does that, it may make me, f it may not be the first thing I want to hear, but I may also respect you more because you did that for me. Or, as you'll notice here, the, the operative mechanism for one person exhibiting virtue and another person following is other praising emotions. So he said, you, I, you might respect me more there. That respect that I feel is an other praising emotion. Other types of other praising emotions are inspiration, elevation, admiration, awe. Those are the kinds of feelings that make people want to follow of their own volition instead of just doing it because you have authority over me or you have something I want or some other extrinsic motivator. I'm doing it because of the emotion it makes me feel. And if we're exhibiting normal levels of virtue, it usually doesn't create those emotions in us. It's like that's what we expect. Emotion comes when you get something that you weren't expecting. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what would be exceptional here? And asking those questions about exceptional. So with decisiveness that Patty just talked to us about, there may be normal levels of decisiveness in these situations in my organization or your organizations. But when somebody shows real decisiveness and, and real um, insight into their decisions that they make, that stands out in a way. We're going to talk about exceptional patience here. And I think this matters in the world today because, well, actually, let's go straight to what uh, we mean. But I have the, well, actually, I want to say two other things about this before we move on. The first thing I want to say is that um, what we mean by virtues. So more common in the business world is to talk about values. And I think values are good. But values, a virtue is a value, but a value is not necessarily a virtue. So. Beauty is maybe something that I value, but it doesn't have moral content. I couldn't go and say, you should be more beautiful. That would not be an appropriate thing for somebody to say, first of all, because most of us have no control over that, right? And second of all, there's no moral obligation to that, right? There's not, you don't have a moral or ethical reason to be more beautiful. Or popularity. Lots of teenagers really want to fit in. They want to be popular. They want to be valued. That's not necessarily, there's no moral imperative to that, even though I value that. So on the other hand, virtues such as courage, compassion, standards of moral excellence, honesty, humility, these things that we refer to as virtues are valued. And in fact, most virtues are, if not universally, are at least ubiquitously valued. But they have moral content to them. And so that's why we use this distinction here and, and pursue excellence in it. And why we say leadership is often about exhibiting values, but positive leadership is about exhibiting virtues and doing it with excellence. Okay, so that's the distinction that I want to talk about there as we move forward. Okay, so back to the slide that I just skipped. Here on this uh, slide, you see a definition of patience. Take a moment. Oh, wait a minute. Ah! I thought I changed that and I didn't. All right, I'm going to tell you the definition because that's the definition of respect instead of patience that's up there. Darn it. <laughs> so much for my preparation. OK. <laughs> definition of patience is, let's see if I can remember this off my top of my head now. Uh, definition of patience is a willingness to, or an ability to not get irritated, annoyed, or um, distracted when there are hardships or delays. Okay, so what stands out to you about a, my imperfect paraphrasing of that definition? Anything stand out to you about it? Can you say it again, Mark? All right, it's an ability to not get annoyed, irritated, or distracted when you have hardships or delays. Okay, there's a lot of emotion involved in that, right? And in fact, in some sense, it's not emoting, which is interesting, right? Is I, am, I have control over at least the negative emotions that come to many of us under these types of circumstances. Good. Other thoughts? Instant self-regulation. Intense. This isn't just self-regulation. It's intense self-regulation. <laughs> All right. That says something about how we feel about this. Good. Okay. 
Yeah. All the three things you said are all negative. Okay, the emotions are. The emotions are negative. Yeah. So instead of saying not having emotions, which is what I initially said to Todd, we might say, could you actually have positive emotions during delay or during um, afflictions or trials or whatever? Yeah. But they're going to be there. So I love that it's sort of normalized, like, oh, yeah, it's going to be part of my work. Yep, yep. In fact, you know, one of the tools that I sometimes use um, since I entered the administration at the university is when something comes up that gives you that pit in your stomach, like, oh, I got to deal with this. I, have this. I just say to myself, that's my job. Right? And for me, <laughs> that just referred, like, the reason you took on this job of being an administrator is to deal with problems and the things that come up. And it's once I normalize that, I don't get as upset about it. It's also powerful for me to be thinking about it this way because I think of, as an entrepreneur, I think of hardships and delays often as a lack of, like, a failure on my part. Like, lost an employee or project went badly or a client is unhappy. And it, I take it very personally. It becomes sort of like, you know, shame as mm -hmm. opposed to, this is the path of entrepreneurship. Like, what can I take from the experience to learn as opposed yeah. to, you know, flogging myself? <laughs> Which seems like a much more healthier approach, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good, yeah. Brian is slightly off the wall, but I feel, you know, between the, the three things you said are negative, the emotion that really comes down is coalesces into fear. Is, I'm sorry, say the last word one more time. Coalesces into fear. Ah, yes. You know, mm -hmm. fear of losing something. Yeah. Both adrenaline on one side and cortisol on the other. <laughs> <laughs> Very biological, yes. It goes into your bloodstream and then mm -hmm. causes all these actions. Mm -hmm. So uh, inculcating a practice of patience, meaning let's take a moment, everything settled down. Yeah. And I There's a reason why people say things like breathe, right? <laughs> right? Is because this is. Biolo the emotions are biological. We tend to think about them as psychological, and they are. They have psychological components to them, but they are also biological. That's how we distinguish them from many of the other cognitions that we have. And once we recognize that, it's interesting how the body affects the mind and the mind affects the body. So a lot of times we think about, um, for example, when you smile, like we think of that as the reaction. But it actually can be the cause as well as the reaction. So there was an interesting study done years ago where um, some psychologists had university students watch video clips of like, for example, funny shows or something like that. And some of them, they put a pen in their mouth and had them uh, hold the pen with their teeth. And the other ones, they put the pen in their mouth and had them hold it with their lips. And what you don't realize is that when you hold it with your teeth, you're smiling, but nobody told you to smile. And when you put it in your lips, you're frowning, but nobody told you to frown. So they basically didn't prime them uh, cognitively. They only primed them biologically, like by the shape that their face took. And what happened is those who watched uh, with the, the pen in their teeth had much more positive reactions. They laughed more. Like the impact on their actual state was different because of how they changed their biology. And there's many other studies like that as well. Absolutely. Now I'm going to take that home example and move it to a work example that maybe some of you might be familiar with here. So one of the things that we talk about when uh, working in teams at work is the dominant 
perspective, in my experience, is people tend to focus on team process. You know, we're getting along, we're not getting along, we're working well together, that kind of thing. So in the 20th century, the uh, foremost researcher on the topic of teams was Richard Hackman. He was at the Harvard Business School. And Richard Hackman had this kind of summary thing that summarized a lot of his research. And it was basically this. It said 10% um, of team effectiveness comes from, uh, wait, let me make sure I get this right, uh, comes from process. 30% comes from the launch when you launch the team. And 60% comes from the design of the team. Now, if you think about this, here's the implication. 90% of your team's effectiveness happens before you ever start the work. But how do most teams get designed and launched in organizations? Oh, we need a team for this. We'll throw you together, you together, and you together, and get to work. And we put almost no thought into design and launch. And then we wonder, why do people hate working on teams? Uh, there was a, my brother-in-law sent me a shower thought from Reddit one time, and it says, when I die, I hope that my teammates will be my pallbearer so they can let me down one more time. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, <laughs> what does that have to do? <laughs> Shower thought. So what does that have to do with patience? Probably that most of us don't spend this 90% of the time that we need to to make sure our teams are effective in the long run because we're impatient. We're rushing through it trying to get to the next thing. Launch means the first meeting, we're setting the norms, we're uh, deciding who we are and what, clarifying what we're doing. So it's meeting number one. Okay. Yep. And I got your comment about patience in your personal world versus your business world is the question I have. So in, in my personal world, it, it, well, I have lots of gray hair. You, know, I've that, uh, you have teenagers? Yeah. I've that I, can, I can manage patience by basically expecting nothing out of anyone else. Beautiful point. And in fact, I'm going to, well, I was going to use it to transfer, but first we'll take Vaughn and then we'll, uh, we'll do a, use it as a segue. Just out of curiosity, how much do the use of psychometric tools help, A, just with patients generally within a team, but especially around team design? By psychometric, you mean? Predictive index, culture index, like teams actually using these tools is. All right. So I'm going to make a confession here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll, I'm going to come back to your question in just a second. Um, I don't want to overstate this, because I do think that there are appropriate uses at appropriate times. But in general, I am not a fan of personality uh, measures and those sorts of things. Um, I don't like. I don't like the predictive index all that much. I don't like the Myers-Briggs indicator. I don't, you know, like whatever else. And I can tell you all kinds of stories about it. There are exceptions to this. So I don't want to come on too strong and say you should never use it. Um, but one of the reasons we built the model that I had up here a minute ago, you'll notice, and this actually ties into what Ramey was saying earlier about we weren't looking for you to nominate positive leaders. We're looking for you to nominate acts of positive leadership is once we start attributing things to individuals rather than attributing them to actions, learning and growth tends to stop. One of the, and that doesn't mean that personality doesn't exist. I think personality does exist at least, you know, we don't always assess it well, but it, it exists and, you know, whatever else. I'm not trying to deny any of that. Quick example. I'm in a meeting one time 
And uh, it's a faculty meeting. It's a, we're planning, um, uh, coordinating, teaching across sections of a class, that sort of thing. And the two of the faculty members are starting to argue about something. And it's a real issue that I think is serious. And I think we've got to figure this out. And about five minutes into the argument, one of them says, well, that's because you're an I and I'm a J, which is from the Myers-Briggs indicator personality type sort of thing. And I was like, OK. And then, and then they said, oh, yeah, that's right. And they moved on as if the problem had been solved. And I'm like, wait a minute. We have an issue we're trying to work through here. And I'm, I'm glad that you're understanding that there might be some personality basis for you disagreeing. But that doesn't solve the problem, right? And it's just completely, I, mean, I can go on. I have so many stories about this. So you, you picked up on one. I don't think it's necessarily unuseful, right? There may be some personality type that is more prone to uh, being impatient and therefore it might help me because I know that I need to work on this more than somebody who has more of a patient type of personality. And that's, if that helps you, then that's great. My experience is that labeling people tends to limit learning and so I tend to avoid it myself. So, all right, back to <laughs> what you were asking about. This actually is a good example of, I think, what Vaughn was talking about here because he says, wait a minute, I've gotten so I, I have a tool that helps me do a decent job at this at home, but it doesn't work for me at work. Well, if we're focused on personalities, what's going to happen? We're going to think my same thing's going to work everywhere and I'm going to you know, not ask those kinds of questions that say, wait a minute, what about the situation and the domain in which I'm working? So <clears throat> what it means is I need to adapt my toolkit to the situation in which I'm in. And the reason I said this might be a segue to the tool that I'm going to introduce to you right now is because the tool, which you'll find, it's, it's uh, in your packet that you got handed out. It's behind the decision-making tool that Patty talked about. Um, what it is, is it's four stories. There's a document that has four stories there. And the reason why we do that is we want to show in different domains, patience looks different and requires different forms and things that we do. And so we need to talk about it. And so having a tool that's some stories that you can talk about does a couple of things for us. One, it helps us to complicate patients. You think, my life is complicated enough. Why do I want my patients complicated too? Well, part of the reason is because it's different in different situations. Um, and so there was some research, I think it was in the, in the 90s, if I remember correctly, by Mayo and Olson. And they said, you know, for 70 years, people have studied social psychology. And if I were to summarize the effect of what we've learned in social psychology, it's that people suck at living up to their values. They think they're good at it. They think they have values. But research suggests that they, we stink at it. So you may have heard, you know, for example, the, one of the most famous examples is the Milgram studies, where the scientists uh, called in two people. One was an actual experimental subject. The other one was actually an actor. The actor was always randomly assigned to be the learner. And they hook the actor up to an electrode, or at least make it look like they're doing it. And your job as the teacher is to ask some word pair questions. And when they get it wrong, you flip a switch and electrocute them. And there's uh, this machine that you do it on. And the first one is like 15 volts, then 30 volts, then 45 volts. And it goes all the way up to 450 volts with a danger XXX over the top. And the research question was, how far will a person go in electrocuting another human being for no other reason than because a person in a white lab coat is telling them to continue the experiment? And the answer is, is that 63% um, of human beings went all the way to the end and flipped it uh, three times. And nobody stopped before, I think it was like 250 or something. And only because the actor started screaming they had a heart condition. right? And that's, that's where the earliest, so 100% went at least that far. And there's various conditions and things in the experiment. People are like, what? <laughs> and yet, this has been replicated on multiple cases you know, with people doing it. So we tend to just obey authority because we're herd animals to some extent. Or you know, another classic example is um, the Good Samaritan experiment. They did this at a seminary with like, students who were training to become priests. right? And 
they basically did it based on the Good Samaritan, which is a story in the Bible, if you're not familiar with it, where the person gets hurt and they're on the side of the road and people walk by and don't help and then finally the Samaritan stops by and helps. And that's the story in the Bible. And so what they did is they asked people, go across campus and give a sermon on the Good Samaritan and then they placed a hurt person in the side of the room and tested to see if they would stop. And so half of them had the Good Samaritan manipulation, half of them just give a talk on a different topic. They also randomly assigned them, You're, you need to be there in, ten, in uh, five, in, what is it? You, it takes 10 minutes to get across campus, but your sermon's supposed to start in five minutes, so you're late. And the other ones were like, they had 15 minutes, and so they, were, they had plenty of time to get there. And what was interesting is, whether or not you were assigned to speak on the Good Samaritan had zero effect on whether you stopped and helped somebody on the side of the road. Whether you were late or early made a huge difference, right? So it suggests context tends to overwhelm values. So my own Olson said, maybe the problem here, or at least one of the problems is, is that values are truisms. We say we believe them because of course it makes sense. You were trained as a child. Your mother said, be honest. Your mother said, you know, be kind, you know, whatever else. And, and so we just kind of learn, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. But then when you get into really difficult situations, like when I'm late or when a person in authority is telling me to do something or whatever else, we haven't actually really done the work to wonder, why should I be honest? Why should I be kind? Have I really thought this through and I have good reasons? or will the overwhelming reasons of a pressure-packed situation overwhelm me in this situation? And so they did research, and so one of the reasons why we have these scenarios and we talk about them is because it makes us think, why should we be patient? What does good patience look like across an array of situations, and therefore what tools will help me to do that? So please take a moment and just read story number one. Okay, as Tom noticed, uh, at the end of the, each story, there's a set of questions that are there. And, and um, you can use those in a number of ways, right? So for example, if I want uh, people to come prepared, I can say, read the stories, answer the questions before you come. Another way I've used them is I've said, hey, in, uh, read your story and then get together as a group and discuss the answers to the questions here in the classroom. Um, and there are a number of ways to use them. The point of the questions is to get us thinking deeply about what does this virtue mean in this situation, how, does it, uh, how do I apply it, those kinds of things, so that the discussion is often richer if we do that. For the sake of time, we're not gonna go into that uh, here in this session today, it's, I'm just introducing the tool. I should also mention that what you see here is uh, this uh, four-story approach to the virtue of patience. We have like six, we have a virtues and vices series of tools in the Project on Positive Leadership, so we have you know, compassion and courage and humility and honesty and creativity and uh, all kinds of uh, tools that are four stories to help us think through a virtue that you can request it. Uh, Ramey put up their PPL at louisville.edu. And so we're happy to share those. These tools are for free. Let me just ask a couple of questions to discuss about this first one. And then what I want to do to make sure that we use our time well is I want to get to at least one more story so that we can compare and talk about the question about working across situations. So. With regards to this one, uh, Brad is the protagonist. What, if anything, could Brad have done to be even more patient than he was in this story? Yeah. Um, just the tone of the whole thing. Uh, he was externally patient, but internally <laughs> impatient. He wasn't okay. really absorbing the conversation. I like that a lot. Um, and for Brad, and maybe for people in his organization, this might have been a huge accomplishment just to be externally <laughs> patient, right? But when we think about patience, right? So Aristotle talked about virtues are ideals. They're, they're forms of excellence. And one of the things that's interesting is, does my internal state reflect my external actions? Because eventually, you might get away with fooling people for a little, uh, you know, Bob Marley, you can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time, <laughs> right? And so um, that matters is uh, it eventually might leak, and then it might have the opposite effect of what you intended if I can't get to the point where it's internal as well as external. Excellent. Other ways he could have been even better, yeah. Okay. And what might be some of my reactions, or um, you know, that might help him to be a little bit more humble and be able to, you know, see it from a place that he might realize she's got something that um, makes sense the way that she's reacting. 
Absolutely, right? So perspective taking can be a tool to increase our patience. And what's interesting is like it might be, for example, for me, easy to take the perspective of my kid, you know, at home or the one brushing their teeth or, you know, whatever it is, but harder for me to take the perspective of someone at work. Um, I used to do a lot of work with uh, uh, public schools and helping uh, doing training for turning around failing public schools. And one of the things that was fascinating in terms of working across domains is how um, usually a principal was a teacher before they became a principal. And many of them were excellent teachers and really good at being patient with children, but really struggled with being patient with adults. And because they have this frame that they're working from, like adults should know better. Well, adults are just big children. I hate to break it to all of us, but <laughs> we actually, uh, we do mature, we do get better, but there's a lot of stuff that we just carry with us our whole lives. And so helping them break the frame of like, no, you can, you, you can learn uh, the transfer. What is the question you can ask yourself, the pe or a perspective you can take to think of your teachers in the same way you used to think of your children when you were in the classroom? Patty? Exactly. So, so it seems like where he's where it said he listened with compassion and then said let's work together. Seems like the missing piece there is then he understood more deeply the issues at yeah. hand. You see what I mean? Like Absolutely. You don't necessarily have to agree with them or take those on, but they widen your view. Yes. And in fact, if I understand you even though I don't agree with you, then that changes the way I'm able to talk to you and work through a conflict. Exactly. So beautiful. Another thing to point out about that, Aristotle argued that when it came to the virtues, it's impossible to achieve excellence in one virtue without also getting better at other virtues as well. They're interrelated. And so Patty tying what we were talking about with patients back into decision making illustrates that idea why those two might go together. Were you going to add something, Suhas? Well, it's, it's the word that I'm going to Oh, well, there we go. Here's, here's what I wanted to say is um, I do a lot of studying with uh, psychology and uh, neuroscience. And uh, one Yeah. It's interesting, that reminds me, my father, when he was managing a large organization once, talked about how he had this epiphany. And for, you know how a minute ago I was saying, like, when something happens that gets that pit in my stomach, I say, that's my job. His thing was, people are not problems, right? You don't solve people. And that was his little mantra that helped him to be patient and, and more compassionate in those situations. You have a hand. Yeah, and this story's been written in the perspective of Brad, you know, and his, his struggle or his challenge with this person. But to me, when I read it, it, it it's actually had organizational issues at play. And Good. What, I, what I mean is maybe it's not even Brad's problem to solve. What I mean is if Subai had the proper incentives in place to perform for the benefit of the organization rather than for her own ego, then that situation wouldn't exist to start with. So I'll use an extreme example. If Sabai's compensation package was, you're gonna get a salary, but you're gonna get a $1 million bonus if the, um, if the organization achieves its objectives, mm -hmm. figure out how quickly she'd drop her ego-driven behavior <laughs> and go toward the organizational objectives, right? But if her incentive package is, you're gonna get your salary if you do a fine job, and we generally are okay, then you're gonna get a 3% bonus next year. I mean, that, that's an organizational issue that comes down to the proper incentives. The second one could be, as you mentioned, if her higher-ups were exhibiting the virtues of positive leadership and doing the things that mean she should be not acting out of her own ego-driven 
reasons, but for you know greater virtues, if she had that example um, set by people in her organization, maybe she wouldn't be acting that way either. Yeah. So I mean, it, it may not be, in my opinion, it may not have been Brad's problem to solve to start with. No, I think that's a very important point because um, it says, first of all, we all should be leaders, no matter where we are in the organization, right? And it also suggests that um, another way that Brad could change his perspective and understand Subai differently. Good. All right, now, for the sake of time, what I want you to do is take the, um, I think it's, let me make sure, is it number four? No, let's do number three. And I want just us to be able to do a comparison here so that we can see about moving across different situations. So please take a moment and read number three. Okay. It would be very easy to be judgmental of the hospital security uh, committee after reading this. And if you said they were impatient, you wouldn't be wrong. I want to ask a slightly different question. As you reflect on your own experience, in primarily your business life, but perhaps maybe in other parts of your life as well. In what ways can you relate to the hospital security committee? Knee jerk reaction, being reactive versus proactive. Yeah, if, if I've ever been reactive instead of proactive, I probably can relate to this committee a little bit, yeah. If I don't take any action, people think I don't care. Okay. So I need to do something. So this actually, really juxtaposes patience versus decisiveness and how two things that are both virtues, how do you keep them in tension in a productive way? Good. Any other ways you resonated? I think part of it's the perception of the community. So you don't, not just the employees, but, you know, obviously it's probably a large hospital and there's probably some PR ramifications if they don't act quick. Yep. And so, we fear others' judgment. And when that judgment is public and it's circulating in the newspapers and you go to a barbecue and you're like, oh, you're, you work at the VA or you've cleaned things up yet or you know, whatever it is, you feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. There was a, was it you had another hand? It's, it's, there's a, it's a short-term benefit and long-term benefit. Yeah. I, I've dealt with it a lot in schools because there's a lot of pressure to be hardening schools Yeah. It's, it's the timeline in some cases that you're talking about. And the hospital needed a short term timeline effect instead of a long term effect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the trick, right? Because the committee, or uh, Paul's committee, was arguing just give us another week or two weeks, right? You know, let's uh, hold on. And the, so uh, you could argue we have to have it right now, and that's what they did. And other people argue, you know, this, I realize it's pressure, I realize people are gonna be judging you, I realize it's hard, but if you wait two weeks, maybe we can actually get a better solution or whatever it may be. So, imagine you're on this committee. What tools could you use to help you be more patient while also making good decisions uh, when you have that kind of pressure on you? Have you developed any tools yourself that help in that situation or, or things that you think might work? Yeah. So one thing that you do is let's send out a survey and ask people for their ideas. Mm. So to go around the wheel, like information while, again, not that that's going to be everything that we do, mm -hmm. but it elicits people's information gives them something where to put their ideas and energy while at the same time allowing you some time. So, so that might be a strategy. They at least see you acting even if they don't see you making the final decision. And so you, you buy a little time with it. Good. The committee had identified that distrust was the root cause. So somehow messaging that if distrust is the issue, how yeah. So as we learn these things, like that distrust is an issue or that metal detectors don't work, are we keeping that in our committee? Or are we actually informing people and telling them about it so they see why we're making the decisions we're making, why it's taking us longer to make these decisions? That communication in uncertainty would be huge.
where they can connect in a dialogue and share what they see with their own expertise. So this is what I see happening every day, and I know it's a risk. So you might not really know from where you work. And it also then allows them, if they're a person who's sort of a change agent in their little you know, area they work, they might say, yeah, they came and talked to me. And, I, you know, and so then it's sort of changing the narrative around those people working on the committee over there who don't even know us and you know, whether anything's happening and they have influence on us. Yeah, thank you. OK, so one of the things I'm hoping this does is you'll notice I took one situation where it's just patience and listening to a human being, right? And it's a very close, immediate situation in which I get to practice patience. Then I jump to something where we have this massive organizational issue with, you know, countrywide uh, committee versus a local uh, top management team. And, and so it's this big issue and yet still, here patience comes into play in terms of how we deal with it. Uh, what's interesting is if we had done the second uh, story in here, the second one was another listening one, but a different listening problem. And so all of these juxtapose situations and help us to think, what, how would I succeed in being excellent in patience in one versus another versus another? And by doing that, not only do I learn how to do it across situations, but I build up a repertoire of tools that I can use and therefore move between tools as I go across different situations as I try to practice acts of positive leadership over and over again and, and learn and get better as I do so. So let me ask one last question to kind of pull it all together here. How, and this is the same question I started with by asking it about Patty's tool, how could you use this in your organization or in your life to help other people lead with patience as well? Identification of constraints um, previously, um, either benchmark or voiced through um, the channels of, we can get to that later, get to that later, um, so that there's not a build up and then you have the bottleneck of destruction, whether it be. <laughs> I'm going to have to use that phrase, bottleneck of destruction. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, good. What else? We mentioned we were talking about music earlier. Certain music lyrics speak very loudly to me. So, um, Kenny Chesney has a song called Better Boat, and it's all about patience. And I have no patience, he had to learn patience. But one of the key lines in the song was he had to learn how to ride the waves he can't control. And this is a, my tool in business where, although I, I have trouble with patience with other people, I have to some days set aside and say, I'm not going to be able to control what they do when they do it, but I got to learn to ride the wave rather than let the wave overtake me, you know, yeah. take it from a different perspective. And now you've got another country music song playing in my head. I'm thinking of Alabama's I'm in a hurry to get things done. Yeah. I rush and rush until life's no fun, <laughs> right? And uh, that's the same kind of idea, right? That uh, I find music helps me too. I love it. I think uh, to build on these comments, it's also just naming it. Like yeah. I was, I was in a meeting yesterday where with a team member who's really struggling. Sorry. a time of transition you know this is a year of transition and for for the work setting we're in mm -hmm. and so I look back and I go well I could also just name it like this is a year of transition we you know we're all we, we our goal here is to be patient and ride these waves and so we talked about it but I thought oh there's times where you could just name it yeah and as opposed to just kind of being implicit or unspoken Absolutely. Can I add to that real quick? Um, I, I love it because when you have a year of transition, so we talked earlier about you know football coach, except it becomes a very high level topic. But a year is 365 days of what someone's one day is either painful or emotional that can be like, oh my gosh, I have to wait a whole nother year to get through this transition. So then they internalize that, like, how do I do that? So having um, things in place to either bridge that gap so we don't come to a uh, threshold of destruction or, or uh, <laughs> bottleneck, of, bottleneck yeah, of destruction. <laughs> um, but I think giving someone the reassurance of, yes, it's a year of transition, and here's how we're going to get you through that year, let alone someone's intensity of like, I'm just trying to get through the day, something, right? Um, right. Uh, right. On their perspective. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's building on what Patty was referring to with a year of transition 
there's a tension with all these virtues of like a patient urgency as, as it's been called. And oftentimes when I'm trying to negotiate someone exploring implications versus pulling the trigger, it's just negotiating that time. Mm -hmm. And so if, if Paul Jones is saying, hey, can we just take one more hour? Or what if we held for 24 hours and I'll get you some prototypes of some other options. But it's that negotiating time and so often those that are more inclined to deliberate or explore implications have timelines that are unreasonable for an accelerated marketplace. And so I find negotiating that time to be really challenging with people and that the shorter time frame I can get them to agree to, you know, sometimes <laughs> it's just 30 minutes, yeah. which might take three hours in the workshop or three days. Yep. But if we could just take a little bit of time to get perspective taken, it would really result in better outcomes. It reminds me, when I teach negotiations to our MBA students, one of the things I try to teach them is when we are negotiating a salary, a price, an, an organizational arrangement, you know, whatever it is, we get, often get in the trap of thinking that's what we're negotiating, when sometimes what you need to do is step away and negotiate the rules of the negotiation, <laughs> including the time, right? And go back and, well, how are we doing this? And I think that's the same kind of idea you're talking about there. Let me just take these two and then we'll wrap it up. Go ahead. Actually, you know what, I'm going to end on you since you asked us the question that started on this. Go ahead, Suhas, first. <laughs> Is it? Can I push you on that a little bit? Because yeah. I would say that, it, you know, when uh, something comes, uh, this is what I said earlier, I get some, that feeling in the pit of my stomach, I usually have to think. My natural reaction is not a good one, but then I say, nope, it's my job. And then I move on, and so I do have to think in order to do it. Well, what you have to think, well, I don't think it's thinking, not thinking. Okay. <laughs> but what you are doing is identifying what is that feeling inside of you. Fair. Okay. Identification it depends on how we define think. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the reason, reason for the identification is because we we'll have almost the same feeling over and over again in our lives. Yeah. But depending on the external circumstance that's going on, you would say the reason for that is this. Yep. Okay. But the feeling is exactly the same. The thing in the pit of my stomach is whether I'm giving an exam or whether I'm going for an interview or whether, whether I have a tiger in the bush. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same feeling in the Yeah. Yep. Change. That makes sense. My, my point, the point I'm making is organizationally and in life, if we say there's something in the pit of my stomach, <laughs> I need to be patient, identify what it is before I act. That's my cue. Yeah, that's it. That's yep. my cue. So it's an alarm system. It's yep. The bell is ringing. Right? Good. Yeah. If you're able to identify rather than it need not be very accurate. Yep. But I've got something to tell me, hey, hang on, don't react, don't, don't, don't jump into this. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So that's where I went. All right, I'm with you now. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> All right. This gentleman's comment a second ago made me think about this whole thing, and it comes down to two words you mentioned: patience versus urgency. And as an entrepreneur, I'm incented and compensated, and everything has about urgency. But how do I bring patients into that setting where urgency is valued very highly by the people I have to report to? Yeah. yeah how do you do that? All right. Well, we have now exceeded our time. So in order to let people go, let me say two things. One is I'm happy to talk about it further. And two is like, as you can see, this conversation can get very big and very energizing because uh, pretty much everyone here, I think, can relate to it, right? And so um, this might be something to think about. So let me just, I'm going to close, and then if you want to talk a little bit more after, we can go there. Um, let me close by saying this. These stories, if you're a trainer or a coach, you can use them and, you know, like, contact Ramey, you know, get the stories, use them in your training, use them in your coaching, you know, whatever it is. If you're a manager and you're not a trainer or a coach, 
at the beginning of a meeting, do one story, and then next week at the beginning of the same meeting, do another story and, and talk it through and take 10 minutes to talk it through or whatever it is. But these are tools to help us you know, make sure we keep doing it. And so that's our mission as a project on positive leadership is we want to get these tools out so that it's not just people who listen to us, but anyone can use these tools and help increase positive leadership in the world. So thank you for your time today.